Welcome to Church, Kohler Church. We're going to go ahead and get started. Go ahead and find your seats. Welcome if you're watching online to our a cappella service. I hope y'all are ready to sing this morning. Clear the aisles and find your seat. Everybody's standing, so I guess they're ready to sing. Y'all ready to sing? <laughs> Pre is not ready to sing. <laughs> yeah. Sing, amen, amen, rejoice, amen, amen, glory be to God. Amen, amen, sing, amen, amen, rejoice, amen, amen, glory be to God. Amen, amen, when the Lord shall come again. Let the people sing, amen, amen. When the Lord shall come again, let the people sing, amen, amen. Sing, amen, amen. Let the people sing, amen, amen. Sing, amen, amen. Let the people sing, amen, amen. Sing, amen, amen. Rejoice, amen, amen. Glory. Amen, amen, rejoice, amen, amen, glory be to God, amen, amen, when the Lord shall come again, let the people sing, amen, amen, when the Lord shall come again, let the people sing, amen, amen, sing, amen, amen, sing, amen, amen, let the people sing, amen, amen, sing, amen, amen, sing, amen, amen, let the people Let the people sing, amen, amen. Let the people sing, amen, amen. Let the people sing, amen, amen. Good morning. How's everybody doing? All right. My name is Sandy Cooper, if you don't know me. And this lovely woman here is my wife, Connie. Uh, so we are here to welcome you to Cola Church, um, but I uh, just want to give a little interesting tidbit. In one week from today, on the 31st, which is going to be Easter, it will be 34 years of being married. Thank you. So I would like to share a scripture to get us started. Um, in Matthew 23, sorry, 27, verse 32, it says, As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. All right? Uh, when Jesus was being led out uh, of the city to be crucified, uh, the custom then was if you were going to be crucified, you had to carry your own cross. All right? But Jesus was exhausted that morning. All right? Uh, he was sleepless. We had a sleepless night. Um, he was suffering from all the pain and the insults of the night before and the trial. And he fell down 
under the weight of the cross. But God provided a man named Simon to be there to carry his cross. All right? And there's an important lesson to learn from this, I think. Um, it's that we don't have to be strong all the time. Right? It's okay to be overwhelmed and to fall down as long as we have people in our lives to help us back up. Amen. So um, at Cola Church, that's what we're all about. And my wife is going to share. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Good morning. <laughs> let me start by saying that I cannot speak of all the people who have helped me carry my cross. Amen. But I'm going to start with three. Three women in this church. One day, while I was a baby Christian, the first woman that I thought of asked me, Connie, have you ever heard the scripture, when I was a child, I thought like a child? And she stopped right there. I had not heard of that, Chris, of that uh, scripture, didn't know anything about it. I did not know I was immature. And it took me a little while to realize that that's what she was saying, because it was such a soft way of, of allowing me to understand what's going on. It was gentle. And I started praying to become mature. She taught me how to speak the truth in love, because that could have been a very harsh thing to hear. The second woman was the person that everyone in my Bible studies looked to when they couldn't remember where a certain scripture was. I studied in 1993, and I still remember this. I still remember being amazed at someone who knew so many scriptures and how to find them. I wanted to be like her. She taught me to love and appreciate God's words. The third woman asked me a simple question and changed my whole character. The question was, Connie, what are you thinking right before you speak? She helped me to be careful with my words and to consider how my words will affect the person I'm speaking to. There are so many other women who made a difference in my life, so many other women who helped me carry my cross. I say to all of you, thank you. If you have hugged me or spoken to me, you have made a difference for me, and I appreciate you. Yeah. So, um, at Cola Church, that's what we're all about. We're all about having brothers and sisters in our lives uh, to help us up when we, when we fall down. I mean, the world can be physically exhausting, um, and, and it could be spiritually demanding, but it's good that we have people in our lives to help us to get through those times, right? Um, so, I mean, Willis used to say this, um, we don't just come to church and bump shells, he used that term. But we get into each other's lives. We are part of each other's lives. So if you're visiting uh, with us today, we welcome you to be a part of our family. Um, we are all dedicated to helping each other build the kingdom of God through obedience to God's word. All right. I mean, our church reminds us reminds me of that um that sitcom in the '80s. Remember Cheers? <laughs> Some of you know, a lot of you don't know. All right. Um, so it, 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 Cheers had a real famous jingle. All right. Um, Making your way to the world takes everything you got. Now this is the hook. Sometimes you want to go where. That's it. Well, everybody knows your name. That's what we are, the Cola Church. Welcome to the Cola Church. All right. So, as usual, we have two churches we're going to pray for. Um, the, the local church is Clemson. And by coincidence, the international church is the church in the Bahamas, where I'm from. So let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be here, God. Thank you for this family you give us, God, that help us through hard times, God. Mm -hmm. Help us, God, to really be in each other's lives, to help each other to navigate this world, God, to, to see your, your word come true in, in many lives, God. God, I pray for the church in Clemson. God, I haven't been there, but I know there are brothers who are worshiping you just like we are. But I've been to the church in the Bahamas, and I know those people. I see them. There's 150 disciples there, and they are just as... Uh, fervent as we are here serving you, and I pray that they're having a great service today too, God. God, and finally, we're having a baptism today, God. 
And I pray, God, that um, this new person in the Lord is going to be something that glorifies you today. God, help us to enjoy the service and help it to be fun. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Please stand. me 
I didn't really understand about uh, Holy Week, didn't really understand about Palm Sunday. I did know that, you know, Easter was about the risen Jesus. Mom and Dad taught me that. God bless them. But mostly it was just about lots and lots of chocolate eggs and jelly beans for the next week. And I was very happy about that. So, But it is Palm Sunday, and today commemorates... Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem the days leading up to his crucifixion. And in Mark chapter 11, starting in verse 1, it says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his, two of his disciples saying to them, and I'm paraphrasing, go get me a donkey. Verse 7 says, When they brought the colt, to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches that they cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Um, you know those scriptures that you read many times, you, you, you read them and then one day you discover something that wasn't there. Uh, I never stopped to wonder about the significance of a cloak. But it says they, they spread their cloaks on the road. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, so I did some reading to, uh, to learn a, bit, a little bit more about the significance and the value of a man's cloak. And this is some of what I found. The cloak was very important in those days. It signified the identity of the wearer and in the Mosaic law, uh, if someone owes you money, you were forbidden to take their cloak as payment. Uh, no matter how much they owed you, they were allowed to keep their dignity by keeping their cloak. Uh, it says uh, it represented a person's ability to survive and exist. And because at night the Jew would take his cloak off and he would use it as a blanket to keep warm as he slept. 
uh, it represented his complete being and his moral character. Often when a person was taken, uh, taking a loan, he would give the lender his cloak as a pledge that he would repay the loan later that day. Uh, it was the Jewish equivalent of someone giving his word. So you see, it had lots of significance and value. Um, it was very important to the owner and, and to, the, to the wearer. And it says, as Jesus was coming into the city, they took this article, this garment, that had so much significance and so much personal value to them, to honor Jesus as he was coming into the city, they laid it on the ground ahead of him. And so I was wondering, you know, what's the modern day equivalent of a cloak? It, you know, what, what represents our whole person? Is it, you know, I got my wallet, I got my cell phone, I got my debit card, I got my car keys, you know, the, the, <laughs> the basic tools that are required for us to take on the day. You know, what's the modern equivalent? What are the things that we value most in our lives today? And how do we honor God with those things? Um, you know, we, 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 uh, we give a, a weekly offering. Why do we do that? We, um, well, we, we give an offering because the Bible says we need to. That's a good reason. Um, you know, we give to support the work of the church. That's good. Uh, support the, the mission field, good. We support churches in the Caribbean and Africa, good, good, good. Uh, we support community outreach. All of these things, these are good and noble things. We should probably continue to do those things. But our giving is about much more than just those things, you know. Our giving is an act of faith. Our giving is... it. it like these people were doing, it's a demonstration of our submission to God. It's an expression of our love and devotion to God. And I think the most important aspect of our giving is that we're honoring God. Amen. So this morning as we're taking up the offering, I want to encourage us all just to focus on these things specifically. Faith, submission, love, devotion, and most of all, we're giving honor to God. Amen? Amen? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for waking us up, for giving us life and breath. God, we thank you so much for all that you give us, Lord, for how richly you bless each and every one of us. Thank you for this church family. We thank you for the opportunity to give back just a portion of all that you've blessed us with, God. We pray that you would bless it and use it to forward your kingdom, God. We pray for the rest of the service. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. So while we're while we're passing the um, trays, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about life. Uh, I hope as you do your kind of daily meditations, whenever you do that, you're thinking about God when you see the world. I, I was uh, thinking about God on the way the, to church this morning. I'm, I'm driving and there's all this yellow dust on my windshield. I don't know if any of y'all can relate to this. And, um, and I thought about how, you know, we just this past week hit uh, a time where we've got more light. The equinox uh, was here this past week. And um, it's, it's made an explosion of life. You can see the life explosion dust all over the, that yellow life explosion dust all over town. Um, and it made me think about a, a, a scripture. In John 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made in him was life. And that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. And here at the Cola Church, we want to be reflectors of the light. 
of God. We want to shine in the darkness, which leads us to uh, our life stuff that we're doing here in the near future. Um, this coming Wednesday, uh, your house church, whichever one you're in, and if you're not already in a house church, please look to somebody to your left or right and ask them about how to get into a house church. But your house church is going to be doing something to shine the light into our communities. And, and I want to encourage you to be part of whatever that is. Um, the uh, next thing about life and light is uh, Resurrection Sunday is coming this next Sunday. We're super excited about that. Uh, Jesus is, uh, as Perry would say, the greatest superhero of all time. And uh, we're going to be worshiping God and, and, and praying and, and giving glory to God about the resurrection. And I want to encourage you to be here next week and bring your family, bring your friends. It's going to be an awesome time. Um, this next Wednesday, the first, we've had a lot of life in, in March, and it's amazing to me that it's almost over. It, it, it's really flown. This next Wednesday is going to be the first Wednesday in April, which means that we'll all be here on Wednesday night. That's um, April the 3rd. So April 3rd, we'll all be here ne next week. That's right. I'm so sorry. That's right. We just talked about this week is community outreach week. The following week, April the 3rd, we'll be here at the building. Um, April the 7th, if you're one of the Bible Talk leaders or shepherds, please make sure it's on your calendar. April the 7th is going to be an all-church uh, leaders meeting. Um, or if you want to be a Bible Talk leader or a shepherd, come on and, 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 and join us and be part of that. That means some of y'all could do this if you wanted to. Um, on April the 14th, that Sunday, we're going to have our Spring Fest, and it's going to be kind of a carnival atmosphere. We're going to have uh, our service outside, uh, Lord willing, and it doesn't rain. Um, we're going to have our service outside. It's going to be here at the church building. Um, they're going to tell you that service starts at 11 o'clock, but I want to encourage you to be here at 10. I don't know if y'all remember last year, Last year was a little bit of a traffic jam, um, and we really want to be able to come set up, be hospitable, and have our guests and friends not have a crazy time trying to figure out how to come to us, and we also want to start on time. So please be here at 10, uh, even though we're not technically going to start service until 11. Um, the rest of the, the month is going to follow a, a normal pattern. Uh, I've got a few other small announcements. It, we believe in being open to the world and trying to share with the world, but you may have taken this to a little extreme. If you have a Toyota Highlander license plate number CLMK739, uh, your car is open and you probably need to go shut some stuff in your car. So um, the, uh, the other thing that I wanted to talk about very briefly, um, we're excited about uh, John uh, Barnett. John, stand up. Where, where are you? John Barnett's going to be, um, he is new to our fellowship here. Please welcome him after church. Give him a big hug. Uh, Bro, we're glad to have you. We love you. Thank you for being here. Um, I hate to do this, but kind of as one comes in, one's kind of leaving. Um, uh, Luke Jenkins, this is his last Sunday with us. Also, go give him a big hug. Uh, the Air Force is sending him to San Antonio. So, So give John and Luke, give them both a great big hug today sometime after church. Um, and the last thing I wanted to talk about is babies. Um, yep, babies. Hold on, I'm getting to the end. So uh, 
As y'all know, uh, the Camerinos, uh, the Camerino girls came a little bit early, but everybody's okay. Uh, Emily is doing well. Uh, the Camerino girls are both home, which is awesome. Amen. That's an answer to prayer. Uh, I'm sure Dom's probably watching. Uh, Dom, we love you. Uh, give our give, give give him a big hug. Um, the other person that you may notice is not here is Nikki because Ruby Keeve came this past Monday. So the Keeve baby is here. Um, and that's exciting. Uh, and the uh, last baby we're about to do right now, and that's Wilford Milton. Good morning again. All right. Um, I want to introduce you. This is Mr. Wilfred Milton, and today he's come to make Jesus Lord of his life. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> so a, a little bit about Wilfred. Um, Wilfred is um, originally fr from Milwaukee. He was born in Milwaukee, mm -hmm. and, yeah, and at age 16, he moved to Connecticut. So he's been there since then. Um, interesting tidbit, um, Wilfred is a, um, a banquet chef. So um, where, where did Barry go? He's going to need to tap some shoulders right there <laughs> for the Christmas party. But we'll, yeah, he was a um, banquet chef, uh, worked in the food in services for 33 years. And uh, he retired and um, moved here to South Carolina in 2019. And since he's been here, he had been looking for a church. And uh, about two years ago, he um, uh, fell upon us. Now, how that happened was... <laughs> <laughs> right. He's got a he's got a, a first cousin in Milwaukee at the Milwaukee Church of Christ. And he just so happened to be in communication with her and asking, you know, I'm trying to find a church in South Carolina. Well, guess what? She knew a church. <laughs> All right. So it was right around the time we had changed our name, right? So we were Columbia Church of Christ and then Nicola, and so she had to figure out which which church of Christ is this, Columbia. And so um she she had a, the eldest at the church and help her figure it out. They got the address, and he showed up here. Um, and then uh, first Sunday, he was here witnessing everything. Second Sunday is when, when he and I met. Yes. Now, it's interesting, the three of us are up here, because you know, it was right after service, and uh, I s looked around, I saw this guy sitting by himself, and I was about to w uh, walk to get to him, and somebody cut me off and started talking. <laughs> and, and it was just so fortunate that my wife was next to me. I said, Connie, Go get that guy. <laughs> <laughs> and then exactly she went like to get that. him in, in the parking lot, yeah. and then she, she was holding him there, and she said, let me introduce you to Clinton. And Clinton just happened to be in the parking lot. Yes. So, you know, that's how that started. Yeah. So, um, but, you know, the interesting thing again, though, is when I, when I approached him, I said, um, uh, my name is Sandy Cooper, and um, uh, I haven't met you before. He said, yeah, I'm Milford. This is my second Sunday here. Um, I said, oh, good. So, um, so what do you think about the service? And he's like, this, it went well, um, but I heard y'all have these Bible studies. <laughs> I'm like, uh, yeah, it's funny you should mention that. Because uh, yes. I was going to get to that in a minute, but <laughs> since you, you cut me off, I'm like, yeah, we do have Bible studies. And, um, uh, would you like to be in a Bible study? Yes. And he, and he, and he of course, um, started studying the Bible, but he had no idea what he was asking for. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, you know, Bible studies, you know, changed his life. It was turning his life upside down. And um, he got a little uh, cold feet because he's like, my whole life is turning upside down. And, um, and actually, he stopped coming for, for a while and, you know, looking at other churches. And then uh, I stayed in touch with him and I called him up one time and you know, saying, how are you doing? So I'm visiting these churches, but... Uh, so I was like, okay, fine, you know, keep, keep, keep looking. Yes. And then a couple months later, I called him back, and he's like, you know, I was about to call you. I said, okay, what's up? Uh, I think you all are doing it the right way. <laughs> uh, I mean, because he was like, you know, you guys are 100% in, and it, either you're in or you're out. And that was his, his thing, right? right? So when he came back, he was all in, mm -hmm. um, never turned back. He's been devoted to the fellowship, the prayer, the breaking of bread, mm -hmm. and... Uh, you know, he's been all in since then. So it's been a joy to study the Bible with him. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. 
So, Mr. Wilfred, yes. uh, I just want to share real quickly. Um, when I think of you, I thought of a passage of scripture I wanted to share. Okay. And this is a, a gentleman that Jesus addressed in the book of John. I'm going to read here in verse 44. Philip um, found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whose the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approach and he said of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And I thought of this passage because one of the things once I started getting to know you okay. was pretty clear yeah. about Wilfred. Wilfred likes to ask a lot of questions, <laughs> yes. but he wanted to know the truth. Yeah. And just like Nathaniel, he was like very raw, very real. You know, he was going to let you know what he was thinking. That's me. And that's him. <laughs> so, you know, but the thing I want to encourage you with is he saw Jesus and Jesus saw him long before yes. he even saw Jesus. Right. And he said, in this, this Israelite truly is an Israelite with whom there's no deceit. Yes. That's you, man, Thank a man you. of truth. I, I just want to encourage you to continue to pursue the truth yeah. yes. in Christ. Wow. Amen. Amen. All right, there's one passage of scripture that Wilfred would like read. This comes from the book of James, chapter four, verse seven through eight. Submit yourselves then to God, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Yes. So, Wilfred, a moment of truth. Yes, sir. So I have two questions to ask you. First question is, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he came to earth, that he died, and was raised on the third day? Put a Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So, what is your good confession? Jesus is Lord. <laughs> all right. So, because of that good confession, I can now baptize you, all right, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all right, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Amen. Right. Jordan River, I'm bound to cross. Jordan River, I'm bound to cross. Jordan River, I'm bound to cross. I've got one more river. I've got. I've got. I've got Cross. My brother, he'll be waiting there, but he can't help me cross. No. I've got one more I've got. He'll be waiting there and he will help me. Lord, my Jesus, he'll be waiting. And he will help me across. My Jesus, he'll be waiting. And he will help me across. I've got no more. I've got. I've got no more rivers to cross. Amen, congratulations.
congratulations. This is your seven minute fellowship break.
this concludes your fellowship break. Sorry there's some of you that I did not get a chance to meet. But we hope to talk soon in the coming weeks. Maybe you've scheduled a lunch date. Prayerfully, you'll get to continue your conversation at lunch. Go ahead and find your seats, clear the aisles. Waiting for one and two more people to clear the aisles. <laughs> this was not a 12 minute fellowship break. <laughs> All right, this next song that we're gonna sing is a oldie but goodie. Way back before we had instruments at Cola Church and you had to bring a songbook to church. So if you don't know this song, we'll probably sing it more often. But here we go. Lord, we sing your praises loud. Sing them to the stumbling crowd. Sing of Jesus and his word. Sing to the earth has heard. Sing of judgment, sing of grace, and sing until we see his face. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. That is why we live and sing, we the servants, he the king. All his power, all his life, living in the church is wide. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. God is justice, God is love, and God is reigning from above. God is sovereign over the land. Nations bow at his command. Until we change on that great day. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Come on, let's sing that one more time. Life, life is but a passing glance. Seek him while you have the chance. We are made of not but clay until we change on that great day. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah.
Morning, church. You can open your Bibles to Ezekiel 8. We're going to be there a lot of the time. I'm going to start, though, in uh, John chapter 2. Uh, <clears throat> we talked about, uh, Derek talked about Palm Sunday. Jesus walks into town triumphantly, and they throw their cloaks down and the palms, and uh, he's on a donkey, and, you know, they're singing Hosanna in the streets. And then he goes to the temple. And in John 2.13, it says, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem in the temple courts. He found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables to those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your father, sorry, zeal for your house will consume me. In verse 18, the Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all of this, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. This sermon is Tabernacle and Temple, part five, destroy the temple. Let's pray. Father God, you are good. I pray that we can trust that this morning. And we can meditate on that this morning as we open your word and as we allow it to change who we are. And I know that can be difficult. I know sometimes we don't want to change. I know sometimes change is difficult. It's hard. We don't want to part with some pieces of ourselves, God, but you are so good and so worthy of giving up everything to be close to you. So I pray that we can uh, be impacted by your word this morning. I pray that your spirit uh, touches every single one of our hearts, that we can hear um, exactly what you want us to hear, that we can hear exactly what we need to hear in order to be the people that you want us to be. God, help us to see you and know you better and help us to become more like you. We love you. And we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, we pray all these things. Amen. 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 Again, I want to welcome everybody. This is Palm Sunday. Next week is Easter, and we are excited that you are joining us for worship this week. We definitely want you to join us for worship next week and the week after and the week after and the rest of the year and the rest of the years, okay? If you're visiting with us, we would love for you just to come and be a part of this family. We are a church that is um, trying to be dedicated to living out the kingdom of God. And this entire year is focused on being kingdom builders. We started in the wilderness uh, where God took the Israelites and he said, I am going to forge you into my people. And it was not an easy episode that they went through. It was not an easy 80 years. You know why? It's because they didn't want to be forged. God was trying to build the kingdom, but the Israelites did not want to partner with him in that. They wanted to go back to Egypt to be back in their slave ways. But we have the whole picture of the Bible now, and we have Jesus. And we're going to talk a lot about the Jesus this morning. Uh, we talk about, a lot about Jesus a lot because we're Christians, amen? Um, but because of Jesus, we know that he is still inviting us into his kingdom to be kingdom people. And he is still forging us into those people who are supposed to represent him and his father to the rest of the world. So uh, that's where we are right now in our sermon series. I do want to mention just a few things. Um, one, one of the announcements that we forgot is there is a teen 
parents and teen teen meeting after church in the fellowship hall at 1230. So if you are a teen or if you are a parent of a teen, please make sure you go to the fellowship hall um, for that meeting after church. The other thing is, uh, Barry did mention this. Um, Yes, my baby, my fourth child, uh, rapidly, rapidly, I'll say, came into the world last Monday night. It was awesome. Um, You know, we were praying for, you know, this to be just completely unremarkable labor and delivery, that we wanted it just to go super smooth, uh, just easy, um, and it went a little too smooth and a little too easy and a little too quick, um, which was great. And we were happy about it. We were joking. You know, we went into the hospital. Uh, it, was, it was like 1020 on, on Monday night, which was actually Monday night was my mother's birthday. And we were joking as we left the house. My parents had come over to watch the other several thousand children that we have at the house. And we were joking as we walked out, wouldn't it be cool if the baby was born on your birthday. And then we jested, and because all of Nikki's labors have been several hours long, that, you know, God would have to do something miraculous for this thing to come out in the next hour. Um, and God did something very miraculous. <laughs> um, that baby was born at 11.42 p.m., uh, 18 minutes to spare, which was, it was, it was awesome. And her name is Ruby, which is, uh, uh, it's, it's kind of reflective of my mother's name, Scarlett, but it's also um, her great-grandmother's name as well. Uh, so it's just, it's, God is poetic that they get to share a, a, a birthday now, and we are grateful for that. But let me say this, all right? There's a new baby in the house amongst all the others. And so, uh, you know, if, if it looks like I haven't had a haircut, you know, blame it on the baby. Uh, if my face looks a little strange or tired, blame it on the baby. If if my clothes aren't as ironed as they should be, or if they have stains on them, blame it on the baby. Uh, if I uh, misspeak or say something wrong or say something crazy this morning, blame it on the baby. You know, two weeks ago, I was in here preaching, talking about Joshua, saying Aaron the whole time. Y'all sitting here whispering, trying to explain to me that I'm saying the wrong name the whole time. Hey, guess what? Blame it on the baby. She wasn't even here yet, right? But uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> I do apologize for that. Little, I, was, I, was, I was in the zone, man. I don't know how I was going. I was, and it's funny because I heard y'all saying Joshua. I was like, I know Joshua went too, but you know. <laughs> I listened back. It was, it was, it was cringy. It was cringy. Um, I apologize for that. I actually, and I actually, uh, somebody... Uh, pointed out something I had said a few weeks earlier, and I meant to apologize for it. I I said something to the effect of, like, everything bad that happens in your life comes from your sin, um, and everything good that happens in your life comes from God, which there, if you go listen to the context, you will will understand what I was trying to say, Um, but uh, that's just not, like, life isn't that uh, black and white. And you can't blame every bad thing on God. Sometimes things just happen. Uh, so blame that on the baby too. Amen. Let's, uh, let's keep going this morning. We are continuing in our uh, Tabernacle and Temple series. And this is the fifth sermon in the series. So it's going to serve as a conclusion to this Tabernacle and Temple idea. It's also going to serve as a transition from our building up section of the year to our building in. So we're moving from talking about uh, being close and intimate with God to moving to um, our characters being transformed by that intimacy with God. So we're moving from our communion C to our character C. This sermon will be starting the transition into that. Uh, And also, this sermon is a kind of uh, precursor to next week's Easter sermon. So if it ends on a kind of dismal note, um, it's because next week will be the part two and the triumphant. Spoiler alert, Jesus is going to die by the end of this sermon, okay? Uh, We should all know the story. Um, You know, you're like, why are you wearing all black? Well, you know, I don't know. It's it's thematic that we're going to talk about Jesus this morning. Um, And I I, want to say this as well. This sermon... um, we're going to be reading a lot of scripture. Are you guys okay with reading the Bible? Coming to church, let's, we're going to read the Bible. And there's going to be a lot of Bible. And that's going to be for a few reasons. One, to make the points that Jesus wants me to make this morning. But two, 
we, I want to encourage all of us to be people that read the Bible. Read it a lot. Read it consistently. Know the Bible. I love what um, Miss Connie was sharing up here earlier about how that sister in her group who just knew where the scriptures were. That, that doesn't come because that person's IQ was just better than everybody else's. It came because by constant use, she learned how to read the Bible, how to distinguish good from evil. Um, let's be Bible people. The world is saying so much and it's saying all these things all the time. And, and, and what's worse is that the world, the world who doesn't know God and doesn't know Jesus, speaks so often about the word of God. And they, they misquote and they mangle and they pervert and they, it's just not the Bible. They will use the Bible, but it's not the Bible. And if we are not careful, we will be swept up by all the lies and the nonsense, just like Eve was swept up. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a few weeks um, as we begin our new series called Dominion. But for right now, uh, we are going to read a lot of the Bible. So <clears throat> the entire idea of this Tabernacle and Temple series was to help us to understand that the Tabernacle and the Temple were buildings created to house the presence of God. But the tabernacle and the temple were merely precursors to the ultimate house of God, which is the church, us, his people. Now it began with a scripture that we read often and remember as that time that Jesus flipped tables and made whips. Now for me, the jury is still out, still out on whether he was whipping people or not. I like to think he was, but I don't really think that is in the character of Jesus to be doing. And I don't think that that scripture can be used as justification to attack hypocrites. Um, but you know, I want us to focus on what happens after he starts driving everybody out of the temple. You know, uh, when this scripture is referenced, um, you'll notice that the Jewish leaders quote back to Jesus what he says at the end of this scripture. The people who saw Jesus as a threat, they are going to take his words in this scripture and they're gonna quote it back to him, right? Because what stuck out in their minds wasn't that Jesus was upset. It wasn't that Jesus was driving out the money lenders and all the cattle and that kind of stuff. What stuck out in their minds was Jesus's statement where he said, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Though misquoted by the Jewish leaders and misunderstood, the words made Jesus's enemies livid. They believed that Jesus was making a declaration they believe that Jesus was threatening to destroy the temple. And we know that's what they thought because when they misquote this moment, they say that very thing, right? This man said he was going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. That's what they quote later on when they're trying to get Jesus killed. So not only did they misquote the scripture, but they misrepresented what Jesus was actually saying in the moment. What they were aware, what they were unaware of when they first heard Jesus speak these words and when they quoted them back to Jesus was that they would be the ones to destroy the temple Jesus was referring to. In fact, while Jesus was referring to his body, the Jews had taken the law and the life that God had given to them to live and they had gutted the law and that life so severely that the temple had actually been destroyed for centuries. They believed and would argue it was because of foreign powers and hostile kingdoms. But their great misunderstanding was never being humble enough to realize that it was their own hypocrisy and disobedience that led to the spirit's departure and the subsequent wreckage of the temple of God. So I'm gonna give you a very quick history lesson about the tabernacle and the temple. 
The tabernacle, like we've mentioned, was a temporary house of God while the Israelites were nomads in the desert. When they conquered most of the promised land and established Jerusalem as the capital of the monarchy, the first temple was built by David's son Solomon. It was completed in 957 BC. Almost 400 years later, Babylon would come, destroy the temple, and carry the Israelites away into exile. 71 years after that, the Israelites were allowed to go back and rebuild their temple, which they did, but a few things should be noted about this second temple. The treasures in the first temple had long been taken and plundered. One of those key treasures was the Ark of the Covenant. Now, why is this important? Well, remember what we've talked about. The Ark of the Covenant represented the majesty and the presence of God. It was meant to be the footstool in the place where God came and sat among his people. So even though they rebuilt the temple, the very reason why the temple was built, the presence of God, the ark that represented the presence, it was no longer in the temple. 348 years later, the second temple was plundered and desecrated. Its altars were used to worship pagan Greek gods. When the Romans came, they too desecrated and damaged the temple, leading to it needing to be rebuilt once more by Herod the Great. That temple was completed in 26 AD. This is just a few years before Jesus starts his ministry. And even though it maintains some of the original religious purposes, Herod the Great allowed the temple to be used for multiple things, including a venue for money lenders and merchants. It was that version of the temple that we see Jesus approach, rebuke, and clear out in the Gospels. So my question is, how does this happen? We see this amazing, triumphant story in the book of Exodus about the God of the universe choosing a people, parting the Red Sea, destroying their enemies, providing food and water from nothing, all so that he could forge them into his people and his kingdom. And yet, in the entire history of the Bible, all the way up until Jesus is beginning his ministry, preaching the good news of the kingdom, God's people, God's people never held to, the, to their true identities. They refused to be God's people. And if you read their language throughout the Old Testament. It's not that they didn't like the idea of being God's people. It's that they wanted to be God's people, but also do what they wanted to do. They wanted all of God's blessings and God's protection and God's sovereignty, but they didn't want to change who they were. They wanted to have their cake and eat it too. And if you, if you read the Old Testament, that's the, that's the whole big problem is that they are claiming over and over and over again to be Yahweh's. Yet their lives never represent. How does this happen? How does the place where the presence of God is supposed to be, how does that fall short over and over and over again. The majestic and glorious building that was designed to be the holy place where God dwelled, the center of Israelite society, it fell from glory. It underwent several iterations because of destruction and desecration, and eventually it became primarily a space where the God Mammon took up shop. 
How does the house of God lose its glory? This is a question that should be acutely on our minds because we are the house of God. We are the new temple. The church is the place where God dwells. If it happened to them, it's possible it could happen to us. So we need to be on our toes, vigilant. Our eyes need to be open. How does the house of God lose its glory? We're going to answer that question this morning. Go to Ezekiel 8. This is where the uh, plethora of Bible reading begins. Uh, and please just stick with me, okay? Ezekiel 8, verse 1. In the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth day, while I was sitting in my house and the elders of Judah were sitting before me, the hand of the sovereign Lord came on me there. I looked and I saw a figure like that of a man from what appeared to be his waist down, he was like fire. And from there up, his appearance was as bright as glowing metal. He stretched out what looked like a hand and took me by the hair of my head. The spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven and in visions of God, he took me to Jerusalem to the entrance of the north gate of the inner court where the idol that provokes to jealousy stood. And there before me was the glory of the God of Israel as in the vision I had seen in the plain. Then he said to me, son of man, look toward the north. So I looked. And in the entrance north of the gate of the altar, I saw this idol of jealousy. And he said to me, son of man, do you see what they are doing? The utterly detestable things the Israelites are doing here. Things that will drive me far from my sanctuary. But you will see things that are even more detestable. Then he brought me to the entrance to the court. I looked and I saw a hole in the wall he said to me, son of man, now dig into the wall. So I dug into the wall and saw a doorway there. And he said to me, go in and see the wicked and detestable things they are doing there. So I went in and looked and I saw portrayed all over the walls, all kinds of crawling things and unclean animals and all the idols of Israel. In front of them stood 70 elders of Israel and Jazaniah, son of Shaphan, was standing among them. Each had a censer in his hand, and a fragrant cloud of incense was rising. He said to me, son of man, have you seen what the elders of Israel are doing in the darkness? Each at the shrine of his own idol. They say the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. Again, he said, you will see them doing things that are even more detestable. Then he brought me to the entrance of the north gate, of the house of the Lord, and I saw women sitting there mourning, weeping, the God Tammuz. He said to me, do you see this, son of man? You will see things that are even more detestable than this. Verse 16, he then brought me into the inner court of the house of the Lord, and there at the entrance of the temple between the portico and the altar were about, fit, uh, were about 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, they were bowing down to the sun in the east. He said to me, have you seen this son of man? Is it a trivial matter for the people of Judah to do the detestable things they are doing here? Must they also fill the land with violence and continually arouse my anger? Look at them putting the branch to their nose. Therefore, I will deal with them in anger. I will not look on them with pity or spare them, although they shout in my ears, I will not listen to them. Ezekiel 10, verse 18. Then the glory of the Lord departed from over the threshold of the temple and stopped above the cherubim. Okay, so first things first, I want to mention this is a vision, okay? It's a vision that Ezekiel is having. Ezekiel literally says that God came, snatched him up by his hair, all right? He's holding him by his hair and he, and, he, and, he, and he takes him into the sky and he shows him a symbolic vision. And the vision 
is of the temple of God. But the temple is filled with idols and idolaters, okay? But but let me say this. We're going to go through those idols and those idolaters. But the idolaters are not foreign or pagan people. They are the leaders of the Israelites, the elders of the people, okay? And he gives four examples of these different idols that were in the temple. First is an idol of jealousy. This was likely a reference to the Asherah poles. The second says crawling things and detestable animals. There's no specific known reference to these images. Some believe they were of Egyptian influence showing that the gods and monsters of their old religions had taken up residence in the most holy place. Thirdly, women mourning for Tammuz. Tammuz is a god of fertility whom the ancient world worshipped. This festival that we see occurring in the temple, the women weeping, had to do with the tale of Tammuz being killed by demons from the netherworld. According to the old legends, Tammuz stays dead for a while until his wife, um, Inanna, who could also be called Ishtar, it was believed, went down to resurrect him. We're going to talk more about that next week. Fourthly, it says 25 men bowing to the sun in the east. Sun worship was a normal and ubiquitous thing in the ancient world. This example being specifically egregious because bowing east towards the sun meant turning their backs on the temple. What was supposed to be the house of God had been completely perverted and desecrated, not by foreign powers or peoples who would eventually come later and destroy it, but the temple was being perverted and desecrated by Israel herself. And the angel then sums it up like this in verse 17. Have you seen this son of man? Is it a trivial matter for the people of Judah to do the detestable things they are doing here? Is it a trivial thing? Is it so simple? Does it mean nothing? Also, must they fill the land with violence and continually arouse my anger? That's a whole separate issue he brings up. Not only were they desecrating the temple, they were filling the land with violence. Look at them putting the branch to their nose, therefore I will deal with them in anger. I will not look on them with pity or spare them, although they shout in my ears, I will not listen to them. Just just think about that. Is it a trivial matter for the people of Judah to do the detestable things they are doing. And what is this about filling the land with violence? Have we seen that before? A land that's completely characterized by violence. Back in Genesis, before the flood, it says the, the people were only evil all the time and that they filled the land with violence, here the, Israel, the Israelites are here again doing the exact same thing. Idolatry was more than just a matter of what they did inside the temple. It was a matter of their lifestyle and the kind of people that they chose to be. Go to Ezekiel 22, verse 23. Let's talk about this violence. Let's look at how the Israelites were conducting themselves. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, say to the land, you are a land that has not been cleansed or rained on in the day of wrath. There is a conspiracy of her princes within her like a roaring lion tearing its prey. They devour people, take treasures and precious things and make many widows within her. Her priests do violence to my law and profane my holy things. They do not distinguish between the holy and the common. They teach that there is no difference between the unclean and the clean. And they shut their eyes to the keeping of my Sabbath so that I am profaned among them. Her officials within her 
are like wolves tearing their prey. They shed blood and kill people to make unjust gain. Her prophets whitewash these deeds for them by false visions and lying divinations. They say, this is what the sovereign Lord says when the Lord has not spoken. The people of the land practice distortion and commit robbery. They oppress the poor and needy and mistreat the foreigner, denying them justice. I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it. But I found no one. The language is the same as in Genesis. The violence is full. It's terrible. And God looked for a man among them. In Genesis, at least he found Noah and his family. Here, this time, he says, not one. So, just like he did in Genesis, he says, I will pour out my wrath on them and consume them with my fiery anger, bringing down on their own heads all they have done, declares the sovereign Lord. So at this point, I'm beating a dead horse, right? Before Babylon and foreign powers came to destroy and desecrate, the people of God got there first. I want you guys Write down that scripture, Ezekiel 22, 23, all the way through 31, and just study through the kinds of things that Israel was doing. Because even though we don't, we live in a far more civilized, see the people of Israel doing that can teach us a little bit something about what we should not be doing. And one of the big things is God has mentioned this idea of they don't see a difference between the holy and the common. They do evil. Listen, they do evil and get their preachers to say the scriptures allow it. They get their preachers to say, hey, this is actually what God wants us to to do. Just think about that. These moments should tell us something about what we are susceptible to. And Satan plays the same game over and over and over again. And we are simple enough to fall for it every single time. I'm not actually sure if the desecration and profanity that Ezekiel saw within the vision, right? The idolatrous temple. I don't know if all that was literal because we know it was a vision, but we do know that several times in history, those kinds of idolatrous things were happening in the temple. What is certain, however, is that the way the Israelites were conducting themselves was extremely profane. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor did they give thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise and the prophets of God, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles and detestable creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in their sinful desires, in the sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity, for the degrading of their bodies with one another. The first thing that goes when we distance ourselves from God is our sexual integrity. It's the first thing that goes. It says they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised, amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. And it's funny, people always, you know, they, they'll see the scripture and, you know, that's where all the arguments about homosexuality come from. 
But, but listen to what it says next. This is not a scripture singling out homosexuality. That's a whole scripture about sexual impurity in general. But then it goes on to say in verse 28, furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. As a teen, I always hated this scripture. I'm like, no, no, don't put that one in there. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. I know we're in Ezekiel. That scripture is from Romans. <laughs> the shoe fits. The pattern is the same. The cycle is the same. If they were susceptible to it in the Old Testament, they would be also in the New Testament. And guys, we're in the New Testament right now. One of the greatest tragedies in the history of creation is when the people of God choose sinful lifestyles that completely misrepresent Yahweh and his kingdom, desecrating and destroying his temple by their conduct. It is awful for the Israelites, so much so that God departed from the temple, leaving it as a husk of a building with no power and no presence and leaving the people kingdomless, weeping and gnashing their teeth. Then we arrive at the New Testament and Jesus observes the temple and he sees its powerlessness and he sees that his people had long since abandoned the heart of their kingdom. Their lips praised God but their hearts were far from him. And Jesus looked at the desecrated temple and he burned with zeal for his father's house. I, I love this moment. Um, I want to say a few things here about a lot of this because I think it's... Uh, very easy for us to look at these scriptures and what we want to do is point at like the American government and say, hey, look, right, the American government is doing what God told them not to do, right? They, you know, support abortion or they support, you know, uh, homosexuality and transgender and all this kind of stuff. But here's the, the problem with that logic is that the American government is not and has never been the kingdom of God. So when you look at the nations of the world, what you should expect is that they do the detestable things. That's the whole point of the Bible. When they went into the promised land, God says, the Israelites, you're going to be my people and you have to destroy everybody else <laughs> because if they stay around you, you're going to start doing what they do. And they already do crazy stuff. And I know that there are people who believe that America is a Christian country. There is no such thing as a Christian country. America and every other nation is the farthest thing from the kingdom of God. We don't, the, the kingdom of God no longer has political power. It is no longer its own nation. It is the church. And it does not use the power or the methods of the beasts that rule the world, the nations that rule the world, we don't fight in the same ways. It, it means, though, as American citizens, we are the church and the only hope and the light that the world has. People will fight and scream about policies. This is going to sound crazy. No policy is going 
to save this world? None. Which means you can vote right, you can vote left, and you can have your reasons for doing that. None of those decisions are godly decisions. They're American decisions, and you have the right to do that. I'm not saying don't do it, but don't try to bring the kingdom of God into it because the whole apparatus is already Satan's. You can cast a lot here. You can cast a lot there. Satan still wins. The only way Satan doesn't win is if you repent from your sins, get the Holy Spirit, be the kingdom community, and help as many people as possible understand that the kingdom is the alternative. The world is going to do its thing. But the kingdom must also do its thing. And those two things are very different. We, we have to understand that. And then we see Jesus here. And I love this moment because the disciples, Jesus doesn't quote anything. The disciples look at Jesus and they see his zeal, his passion. He is flipping tables. He is upset. He is angry. He is in, indignant because the house of his father has been turned completely upside down. It's been gutted and desecrated and the people don't care. And guys, Jesus feels just as indignant about us, his kingdom, his church, the new temple. Okay. And if we're supposed to be followers of Jesus, I talk, we talk as a leadership a lot about us as a community. That's because when you read the Bible, that is the story of the Bible. God is God and he wants us to be his people, not his person, but his people. And so, yes, I, I, I can preach sermons about God is good and he loves you and you know, he has grace for you and, you know, um, um, he wants to hug you and he's nice. Um, a lot of churches do that. But God has given me and the leadership here the responsibility to give our everything, to present us all, all of us, perfect and mature in Christ. Your responsibility is to be intimate with God in prayer and in the word constantly, always, so that you and your time with God can remind you of his wonder and his goodness always. When we come here, what we are trying to do is remind us of who we are as a community and as a people, that God has given us a mission and an identity. And if Jesus was zealous for his church, so much so that he gave himself in a fury to drive out all the idols, how much more as Jesus's followers should we be zealous for the church? And I, I want to encourage all of us to get out of our small individual minds where all we're thinking about is, what am I getting from this place? That is the furthest thing from a Jesus attitude. It's the furthest thing because Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve. The moment you become a Christian and you get the Holy Spirit, you become a Jesus person, which means you are no longer here to be served. You are here to serve. And I want to encourage all of us, if we can value this church body, if we can value this family, then we can begin to build a passion within ourselves about really fighting for one another, about being exhausted for one another, 
about stretching ourselves for one another. Paul says he labor and strives, not with all of his energy, though he did, and he took himself to the limits. But he says, I can go beyond those limits. I can do all things through him who gives me strength because I labor with the energy that Christ gives me. Do you have zeal for your father's house? Jesus, with force and conviction, drove out the moneylenders and merchants from the walls of the building, but he knew that would not save the temple. This is the scary part. Bear with me. He drove out all the idols, but even then, Jesus understood that wasn't going to fix the broken temple. It wasn't going to fix the house of God. It wasn't going to fix the desecration. Jesus knew that to fix the problem, the idolaters needed to be killed. Ezekiel 9, read with me. Verse 1, Then I heard him call out in a loud voice, Bring near those who are appointed to execute judgment on the city, each with a weapon in his hand. And I saw six men coming from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. With them was a man clothed in linen who had a writing kit at his side. They came in and stood beside the bronze altar. Now the glory of the God of Israel went up from above the cherubim where it had been and moved to the threshold of the temple. Then the Lord called to the man clothed in linen who had the writing kit at his side. And he said to him, listen to this. Go throughout the city of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of those who grieve and lament over all the detestable things that are done in it. As I listened, he said to the others, follow him through the city and kill without hesitation. Sorry, without showing pity or compassion, slaughter the old men, the young men and women, the mothers and children, but do not touch anyone who has the mark. Begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the old men who were in front of the temple. Then he said to them, defile the temple and fill the courts with the slain. Go. So they went out and began killing throughout the city. While they were killing and I was left alone, I fell face down crying out, alas, sovereign Lord, are you going to destroy the entire remnant of Israel in this outpouring of your wrath on Jerusalem? He answered me, the sin of the people of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great. The land is full of bloodshed and the city is full of injustice. They say the Lord has forsaken the land. The Lord does not see. So I will not look on them with pity or spare them, but I will bring down on their own heads what they have done. Then the man in linen with the writing kit at his side brought back words saying, I have done as you commanded. This is crazy. God snatches Ezekiel up. He shows him the idolatry and then he, he brings him down and this man comes up with a writing kit and, and, and a few others with deadly weapons. And God says, man with a writing kit, go mark off everybody who recognizes that this is idolatry and they weep for it. And those who do not, kill them. Kill them all. And the scripture ends with the man with the mark coming, the, the writing kit coming back. I have done as you asked, which means as he was doing that, the other men with the deadly weapons were slaying the people in this city. Now here, as Christians, is one of the scriptures that make us very uncomfortable. And don't get me wrong. There are real moments in the Old Testament where God commands his remnant to destroy people in this very same manner. But I do want to point out about this specific incident that, remember, it's a vision. It's a vision chock full of Old Testament language. This is a symbolic premonition that God is giving Ezekiel. It's not literal, and in it, we see God tell his faithful to slay without compassion or hesitation any who the angel with the writing kit has not marked off. Now, what does that remind you of? Is there another incident in the Bible where God's destroyer comes? But if you bear a specific mark, 
you will be passed over. Those without the mark, however, were destroyed without mercy. This is an obvious reference to the Passover. Now in that story, if they were obedient to the word of God, the blood of the lamb would be placed on their door and the destroying angel would pass over them. This moment was specifically during the plague of the firstborn. But there is a larger symbolic understanding here. Those chosen and set apart by God would be saved and those who were not, the Egyptians would be destroyed. It goes even deeper than that. How were the Egyptians defeated in the end? They were defeated by their own folly. They followed the Israelites into a miracle where they were not welcomed. And their own sin came crashing down upon their heads in the form of the waters of the Red Sea. It's the same language that God uses. I will bring down on their own heads the consequences of their sin. They were destroyed by the sin that ruled them. And here, while in the vision, God commands his faithful to kill the idolaters, he says he will bring down on their own heads. It's the same language. And in reality, the thing that destroys the sinners is the very sin they practice. I quoted Romans 1 earlier. The spirit in Romans 1 gives the same refrain. God brings down on their own heads or as Romans 1 says, hands them over to their own desires. The wages of sin is always death, church. Where there is sin, it will mature and something, something, something will die. No one is exempt from this. And because we are all sinners, we are all under this curse. Pilate tried to wash his hands, but the cosmic scheme could not be undone by that petty water. He would end up in the same boat as the Jews who screamed, let his blood be on us and our children. Church, we are in that very same boat. Here's the truth. It's what I came here this morning to say. We have these examples from scripture to teach us timeless truths. We, the kingdom, the people of God, the church, are supposed to be the place where God dwells. We're supposed to be living the kingdom of God, the place on the planet where heaven meets earth. Even more so than the Israelites who had the temple among them, we have the spirit within us. Therefore, how much more are we called to live in a way that exalts God rather than profanes his name? We know this, all of us know this, but we live in a culture that is so counter kingdom. And every single one of us wrestles every day with which gods we should bow to. The temptation to bring our idols into this temple is overwhelming. And I'm not talking about Ashura poles. I'm not talking about crawling things or detestable animals. I'm not talking about weeping for Tammuz or bowing to the east. Our idols look different. Our gods wear new faces. They look like worshiping individualism over community. We put ourselves, our families, our careers, our kids, and whatever else we feel like in front of this kingdom community. They look like chasing the American dream over helping souls know Jesus and mature in him. They look like not actually believing in the restorative, reformative power of the Holy Spirit and therefore staying in cycles of unrepentant sin. We are stuck in pornography, stuck in awful marriages, wrecked by selfishness and self-righteousness. We are stuck in pride and arrogance, stuck in strange nationalism, worshiping national parties and presidents, foolishly thinking that they are in line or as powerful as the kingdom of God, which they are neither and never will be. We are stuck in prejudice, in apathy, in anger and in folly. I don't know what your gods are but we all have them. And Jesus stood at the threshold of the temple, seeing its fall from glory, recognizing that something drastic had to be done. In order to save the kingdom, in order to save us, in order to restore the glory to the temple, Jesus knew that extreme violence would have to be enacted. The old temple would need to be destroyed. 
Remember this, church. Only through extreme violence can we be saved from our cycles of idolatry and sin. Only through extreme violence. In Ezekiel's vision, he sent the faithful to enact this violence. My question this morning, are you willing to be as violent as they were towards the idolaters? But for us, the object of our violence should be our sin. And even if we're not there yet, even if we're not willing to kill the sin in our lives, Jesus wants us to understand something. Regardless of how violent you're ready to be towards eliminating sin in your life, Jesus was willing to be the scapegoat. The tragic and wonderful thing about this whole story is that the destruction that God would bring on the heads of us sinners gets intercepted. We read about the violence and the wrath and the anger of God coming down. And Jesus understood that that indeed was going to be the solution. Jesus saw the profane temple. He knew it needed to be destroyed and therefore he allowed himself to be handed over. He decided to take all the idols, all the old gods, all the darkness, all the sin. He embodied himself the old temple on the cross with its laws and regulations. And he embraced the extreme violence that should have come down on us. That is what the cross is. Jesus hung and died so that everything, including the lives we live, can be made new. Isaiah 53 Verse four, surely Jesus took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds, we have been healed. We all like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. Let's pray now for the bread and the cup. God, thank you for your son. It's sobering to read stories like this. Sobering to have to look at ourselves and ask, What parts of me are profaning your holy name? Whatever they are, because we all have them. I pray that we're not discouraged this morning, but that we can think about Jesus's indignation and about his conviction and resolve to intercept all of your wrath the extreme violence we see in Ezekiel 9. It looks bad until we realize it's worse because all of that violence fell on your son. And now as we take the bread and the cup, I pray that we can meditate on that sacrifice and on his death because through it, everything that enslaves us gets broken. And we have the chance to be free and live new lives. Your son, Jesus' name, we pray all these things. Amen.
our service please stand for one final song time is filled with swift transitions not a nothing who can stand Changing hands, build your hopes on things eternal. To God's unchanging hands, trust in Him who will not leave you. Whatsoever you may bring, if I am still more closely to Him, please. You got a hold to his hand, to God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. To God's unchanging hand. Covey not this world's vain riches that so rapidly decay. Seek to gain the heavenly treasure. Something's eternal to God's unchanging hand. When your journey is completed, if to God you have been true, fair but the holy glory of oh, raptured soul of you. You better hold oh, oh, oh. and build your hopes on things eternal. 
something's eternal oh, Two gods unchanging hands Let's build, build to your hope Something's eternal oh, Two gods unchanging hands Build your hope Something's eternal oh, Two gods unchanging hands Dismiss. Go finish those conversations you were having. The book.